So, landscape parks are often regarded as Britain's great contribution to world art. I think landscape archaeology is Britain's main contribution to world archaeology. But perhaps it's become so established and so familiar to us that it sometimes slips into archaeology's background only to be excitedly rediscovered by new generations who thrill at its ability to challenge assumptions, frame stories and support good management. It took me about uh, two minutes to find those books on uh, Google on landscape archaeology and I could have illustrated it with a similar number quite easily. I'm an optimist and I sense that landscape archaeology is growing again. It's had a period, period of quiet, I, I think. I think Mark will agree, and many of you. It appears to be growing again because it's a non-destructive, inexpensive, repeatable and challengeable method. It helps people consider the future of valued places and allows everyone to be an archaeologist. So what do we mean by landscape when we do landscape archaeology? I tend to stick with this wonderful definition. An area as perceived by people whose character is the result of the action and interaction of natural and or human factors. European Landscape Convention 2000. It means that landscape is about place, of course, but it's mainly or more so about people doubly about people, their actions, what creates the landscape archaeology that we study, and their perceptions, the way that we do landscape archaeology. So without perception, and without people, there is no landscape, there's just environment. <coughs> landscape archaeologists help society, they help them by drawing out the meaning and the value of places. It's not inherent, therefore. The landscape is also fundamentally about change. Physical change, the change that leaves the archaeological remains. Change in understanding and appreciation caused by interpretation and reinterpretation. And change in values, the result of what you might call the assessment of significance and character, something that uh, we're increasingly asked to do for example, by the NPPF, National Planning Policy Framework, and most of our, um, our own policies. So landscape archaeology is done, I think, for ourselves as individuals. It's so enjoyable. But we do it mainly for society. We help people understand place. We help them make better decisions about the future of place. Landscape archaeology, what is it? Um, there are lots of different um, definitions, I suppose, but it discovers things, discovers patterns, discovers features, discovers uh, the historical within what appear not to be historical. It critically appraises things, it records them, analyzes them, interprets them all the way from earthworks to structures. It does so for reasons to protect, including providing the information that leads to designation, for management and maintenance, planning for change, and for stimulating further research and investigation. Well, the session that uh, we're, we're involved in today um, illustrates six of the many ways that landscape archaeology field archaeology in particular, helps our sector deliver its aims. So Cara is going to be examining poorly understood but threatened types of site. Andrew Byrne is going to be observing how landscape archaeology improves commercial appraisals, assessments and investigations, I think. Is that right? And Charlotte and Carl are considering when landscape archaeology is best used in complex programs of investigation. 
Richard Newman is going to be talking about how it should be central to environmental impact assessment, amongst other things. And Mark, my colleague Mark Bowden, will be talking about how narratives derived from landscape archaeology engage managers and engage the public. I hope I've got that right. Yeah, we'll <laughs> and the sixth one is mine. I'll be talking about how landscape archaeology can be used to efficiently and comprehensively get to grips with the history and future of poorly understood extensive areas, which is what Bob Moore was 35 years ago. Bobbin Moor was already a protected area as an area of outstanding natural beauty, but it was susceptible to various forms of change, afforestation in particular back then, but also road building, extractive industry, China clay working in particular, and agricultural improvement. But it was remarkably poorly known, except by the farming inhabitants who know it very well. Then in the early 1980s, the Royal Commission on Historic Monuments for England and the Cornwall Committee for Rescue Archaeology uh, established a program which covered the whole of Bodmin Moor, about 200 square kilometres. And we can now look back at what we did then and appreciate some of the benefits of landscape archaeology. We've had the results in place for nearly 30 years and we can talk briefly about the benefits that society has received from that. So the Bodmin Moor survey was led by aerial photography, uh, a transcription from vertical photographs that were specially taken for the survey, um, and initial interpretations by the um, aerial photograph archaeologists uh, covered all of those 200 square kilometres, and 185 square kilometres were then thoroughly field worked, mainly by the Royal Commission checking and adding and analysing what was apparent from the air photo plots. Another 15 square kilometres, a very large area, was subjected to measured survey at a scale of 1 to 1,000, using the aerial photograph transcripts as a fixed and accurate framework. Then the analysis, the interpretation and further research led to the publication of two volumes one on prehistoric and medieval Bobbin Moor, Bobbin Moor Volume 1, as we know it, and Bobbin Moor Volume 2 on the industrial and post medieval remains. The Bobbin Moor Archaeology Survey was done just when the concept of total archaeology was taking hold. That may not mean much to some of you, but back then it was a radical new approach. It meant you looked at everything, all themes, all periods, all aspects. So you were able to interweave the narratives of change uh, in farming, in industry, society, domestic life, ideology, issues, and so on. The outputs from the survey included databases, including a much enhanced sites and monuments record, as it was back then, historic environment record. Um, period maps for the whole of Bodmin Moor, which I've sampled there for prehistoric, medieval and post-medieval Bodmin Moor and industrial. Summaries and recommendations drawn from all that material, all designed to improve, to improve heritage management. So over the next 15 years, hundreds of new schedulings were made of uh, mainly prehistoric and medieval remains, but also some industrial. And I think it's fair to say that Bodmin Moor is now firmly on the archaeological map. It's no longer terra incognito as it was in the early 1980s. I imagine many of you have heard of Bodmin Moor. It's in Cornwall, by the way. I think I've forgotten <laughs> to say that. <laughs> but it's, I think it's a well-known archaeological landscape now, which it certainly wasn't before this survey. So it, it did its own work, but then it stimulated other work, some of which was even more exciting, I think, than what we did, I think it's fair to say. <clears throat> some of that was um, formal archaeology, if you like, and following on from planning for, say, China clay working, the excavation of a ring cairn in the middle on the right, or a longhouse 
at the bottom right in advance of Colliford Reservoir. Some excavation was purely research-based at University College London, working at Le Skernick. And Time Team at Routor, that's the bank can that uh, was excavated for Time Team, all t entirely informed by the Bodmin Moor survey. Also phenomenological work. I couldn't squeeze it in at my the right font, I'm afraid. I, was, <laughs> I almost translated it for you, but I thought I'd leave it. That's the Chris Tilly approach, which was um, partly developed on Bodmin Moor using the Liskernick Hill and the ar archaeological remains from prehistory on that and exploring how we can use our own um, experience of the archaeology to think about how people in the past might have appreciated and understood the place. And we've also got reconstructive archaeology in the top left where Tony Blackman um, built three Bronze Age roundhouses which also could be experienced um, on the sites of earlier roundhouses within their original place with Kilmar Tor lowering behind. And I'm afraid that the Bombing Moor survey led to something else, which is historic landscape characterisation, which was first done on Bodmin Moor in advance of a landscape character assessment. I'm not really afraid. I'm really pleased that it happened. Uh, I think historic landscape characterisation is landscape archaeology. It's a very low level and spread and flattened landscape archaeology, but it is it. And together with the Bodmin Moor survey, um, it helped us uh, extend our understanding gained from the more detailed work. The Bodmin Moor survey, together with the historic landscape characterization, enabled improved partnership working. We had material with which we can um, talk to partners, landowners, agencies, and so on. We could set our material alongside that of ecologists or farmers or road builders. And for example, when we worked with DEFRA, we established premier archaeological landscapes, those areas that are coloured pink, quite a large proportion of Bodmin Moor, nearly 30%, and managed that with the agreement of Natural England and the farmers differently from premier ecological landscapes, which more or less complement uh, those so that we can use our understanding to get properly integrated management of a valuable place. And planners can also use the you know, Bobbin Moore survey and the HLC, Historic Landscape Characterization, to understand the character and significance of the whole moor and ensure that change is sensitive to both. So for example, wind farms haven't yet reached Bodmin Moor. You can see these from it, but they are still five miles away. I don't know if you know Cornwall, but if you've been there in the last 10 years, it's now become the county of wind turbines. I think it's fair to say, and I think I can say it because I, I live in Cornwall still, that although it was undertaken 35 years ago, it's an early uh, landscape uh, archaeological project, the Bodmin Moor survey now influences all decisions regarding the moor. Bodmin Moor would be not Bodmin Moor if it hadn't been for our survey. I'll just talk briefly, because I'm coming towards the end, about what landscape archaeology has contributed to wider archaeology. I think it's contributed logic, the logic of relative chronology in particular. I won't go into detail what that diagram is showing, but it's meant to illustrate various forms of relative chronology that ar archaeologists can see from above ground remains. Landscape archaeology is the oldest archaeology in Britain and it has established many of the terms, the logic and the language of, of more general archaeology or of archaeology. And that logic is transferable, helps those working with other forms of archaeology besides field survey to understand what they're, that what they're recording and what they're interpreting. So aerial photograph transcriptions, geophysical survey, excavations, LIDAR, everything like that. The deepening of our understanding of what comes from those sources is um, improved by the logic that comes from field archaeology. 
And conversely, what we learn from those other techniques feeds back to us as field archaeologists so that we can improve our ability to interpret what we're looking at. So it's a, a nicely reflexive, multidisciplinarian approach to the place in landscape archaeology. So, for example, here's a, a place, not on Bodmin Moor, but up in Lancashire, I think, called Ashnot, Ashnot Lead Mine, which is a scheduled monument, a scheduled monument that was at risk uh, through farming. And we've got several representations of it. This absolutely gorgeous aerial photograph, which catches much of the character and starts to display relative chronology. You can see cuts and superimpositions respect and so on in that image you can uh, send up a uav or a drone and produce a structure from motion image i'm sorry about the focus but you can see if it were in focus that you'd be capturing more in more features than was visible in the aerial photography you can locate them precisely <coughs> in three dimensions and you can, again you can confirm some aspects of relative chronology and then you take those two, and particularly the second, the structure from motion model, go into the field and observe closely all the relationships, scrutinize them, see uh, time depth, interpret features, give them um, functions, if you like, and graphically present them using long established conventions, including, of course, the hasher, all of which are designed to display that chronology and display that display that um, interpretation both accurately and I think simply. It is possible that it's only archaeologists who can read this, but it is also possible that the, the wider public has become sufficiently familiar with our conventions and our language to understand such images. So all these approaches working together create a subtle landscape archaeology. And it does involve skills. It's not something that anybody can do well immediately. There are lots of skills that, that need developing, observation, recording, analysis, interpretation. They are learnable. And Historic England and others, Historic England was supported in this case from the IFA, CIFA, provide training, as Carl will explain in a moment. And we're working with universities to provide courses and whilst we're in Leicester, I can say that we're doing one later this summer here at Leicester University. I think it's fair to say that everyone at this conference, everyone in this room, I hope, makes good use of landscape archaeology. And we do it for various reasons. It supports our application of the NPPF, National Planning Policy Framework, and other research frameworks helps us produce good conservation plans and manage places for the future. All of those are done better when landscape archaeology is employed. I think I've begun to answer my questions and I expect my five fellow speakers will add more. <laughs>